also welcome to the more than 350 people who chose not to come here, but to watch us online instead. My name is Christoph Meinrinken. I'm the program director of the Master of Science in Information and Knowledge Strategy here at Columbia University, in short, ICANS. About once a semester, we decide to invite um, an exciting speaker to talk to us about a topic of that we all find relevant at the time. Um, it's not just for us students and faculty of Columbia or even other institutions, it's also very much for the students and faculty to keep up an intellectual exchange with the uh, um, industry professionals in that area of expertise. Um, a lot of here, um, a lot are here tonight as well. Um, so hopefully later um, for the um, over kind of wine and cheese, we will all make a few more colleagues, if you will. It's my honor tonight to introduce Ben Royce. Um, ben Royce at Google leads the development of their cloud-based customized client solutions. Um, ben very much exemplifies what we in ICANS like to refer to as being smart about technology and people. So what I mean by that, for example, a few months ago, I had a conversation with um, Ben. Where are you, Ben? Oh, over there. I had, a question, I had a conversation with you. I think we were talking about some detail in your um, AI class that you teach for us. And then I was like, so what about your day job? What are you up to? And he said, oh, I'm actually leaving for a flight. I'm going to go to a hospital. And I said, oh, hospital. And he said, yeah, I'm going to talk to, um, I think it was obstetrics and gynecology. Um, and I'm going to talk to them about in an AI system that could help them decide when, at what moment, they might switch to cesarean. I was like, oh, wow, well, how does that work? And, you know, there it goes. Well, we deploy the AI system and the machine learning, blah, 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 blah. You can imagine, like, someone who actually works with the engineers at Google. It's incredibly exciting to, to listen to this. So then I said, wow, that's fascinating. So how do you make sure that the doctors in the room and the nurses and the father and the mother and the family also stay involved and you get their wisdom on board as well and you integrate all of this and you make sure that this system that you're implementing you know, works harmoniously um, um, over time with everyone being at the table and everyone's wisdom included. And he had an incredibly long and detailed answer for that as well. Um, and that's very much what ICANS is about. Um, many of us like technology and people at the same time. And Ben Royce, our speaker tonight, very much ex exemplifies that. Welcome, everyone. Ben Royce. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, 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 I generally try to find the, um, like, technology is wonderful, but, but <laughs> the human side is so much more interesting to me. Um, but you have to understand the technology to get there. Uh, so I'll try and do that today. Um, I've had the uh, unusual, un well-timed, but unusual pain and pleasure of um, the last year being almost exclusively about generative AI um, in my class that I teach, but also um, in my day job at Google. Uh, I've talked to about 300 different executives uh, from every single sector, from public sector and government, from the Department of Defense to manufacturers, retailers, train companies, uh, digital natives, as they say, like software companies. Um, and it's a it's an odd time because I originally was reading the first, uh, one of the first research papers called Text to Image Diffusion Modeling, which was not a great uh, title for how important it was. And it was basically describing how you could take a sentence, describe it, and it would generate an image pretty accurately. Uh, it was pretty cool. And I was like, remember thinking like, this is kind of a big deal. Uh, and it kind of was being undersold under this a lot of academic language. Um, so I uh, decided to put together a presentation um, about why this is, how this is going to affect the advertising industry. Um, and I got sent to the south coast of France to a town called Cannes, where if you're in advertising, it's like the big creative annual get together on the beach in June. Um, and Google set up a huge thing, like 150 people. It's not too different than this room here. Uh, tons of free rosé, which is like their move. Um, and I came around the corner and uh, on stage and only two people had showed up. This was May of 2022. Uh, and I was like, well, that was weird. So one, thank you for coming. Appreciate that. That makes me feel good. Um, but more importantly, I was like, why did that bomb? And they kind of like, oh, it's wonky. It's 
kind of technical. It's not cool. It's not creative. And I was like, oh, okay. All right. And then not even six months later, all of a sudden we had like people were like the people who we had invited who didn't show up were now asking us about how these models worked and how they could. And they were to, you know, all sorts of accusations were flying around. So what I want to do today uh, is one, thank you for coming uh, and, and joining on, on Zoom as well. Uh, uh, but two is I want to show you kind of what I've learned talking to some of these executives, because I don't think necessarily what um, the average person is consuming in terms of information, it's not inaccurate, but it's not helpful either. Uh, so I want to go through some of the things that I've uh, learned along those ways and some of the things I wish that I had been told earlier that I discovered along the way. Um, so with that, um, again, my name is Ben Royce. Uh, I teach AI uh, in the School of Professional Studies here. I um, also teach uh, digital um, workplace and digital disruption uh, with Josh, who's here. Thank you, Josh. Um, and uh, I work on a team that mostly builds these things. I'm, I'm not here on behalf of Google tonight, um, so I will say the things that need to be said. Um, I do think that, you know, this stuff is important and I do think generally Google's pretty good at it. I will say that I can say that honestly being separate um, for that. But of course, disclaimer, I have to do this in the academic world. I do have, um, yeah. Oh, is it not sure? Um, I do have to disclose essentially uh, that I do have financial interests involved in Google, as you can imagine, uh, and a lot of the other companies I'm going to talk about too, because I like to spread my bets. Um, so just be aware that is true, and I do like to make, make that clear. Um, so someone's like, "Well, you're a shareholder." It's like, yeah. Also, in all my competitors, um, so uh, play the field, as they say, right? Um, diversified portfolio. Can you see it now? Cool. Thank you. Uh, okay, so a couple things uh, I want to say is one: uh, How did we get here? Um, most of the conversation is around something called large language models, which I'll refer to as LLMs. Um, there's also large image models. There's a bunch of other things, but really it's based around this concept of uh, a, a technology called transformers. No, not the robot uh, or the stuff from the 80s or the TV show or sorry, TV shows and movies. I mean, literally the ability to transform text into image or uh, other text into other text or summarize. It's just basically a way for machines to learn this stuff. And that's generally um, not that new. It's been around since about 2017. Um, and credit to OpenAI, they did something, they took that technology and they did something really, really smart with it. They threw a ridiculous amount of data at it. Um, and it turns out that this technology isn't that new, but we just never actually took the time to really curate a massive, and I, when they say large language models, large is not large, no, is not a good descriptor. It's absurdly big. Um, so 500 billion parameters in some cases, that could be 500 billion words. That's a lot. Um, and basically there's this, it's not a linear learning curve. Um, it doesn't get like twice as smart as you get twice as much data. It doesn't really get any smarter until it hits a certain break point and then it exponentially takes off. And they found that point. Um, people ask exactly what that point was. It's somewhere between 5 billion and a hundred billion parameters, parameters being words or phrases or something like that. Um, it doesn't really matter because at that point, the questions you ask it are more important than the data it's trained on. If you're asking very narrow questions about a very specific topic, it doesn't have to be that big, but the data it does have has to be trained on that, right? Um, when you're looking at general, general technologies, um, like you're gonna ask it everything under the sun, like a chat GPT or a BARD, you do need a lot more data because the likelihood that you cover the question in the training data has to be there. Um, but generative AI, and I've noticed this weird pattern, Generative AI, uh, a lot of people think it's replaced AI. This is not correct. It's one of basically four um, basic areas. Um, we actually started with prediction. That was one of the first things we did. Uh, this was you know, 10, 15 years ago when we started getting good at it. It's well over, it's decades old at that point. Um, then we moved into classification. This is the classic cat, dog, show me a photo, train a photo. It's a cat, it's a dog, or whatever you want, right? Images were pretty, um, the most, the biggest use case, videos, um, were pretty popular. Um, then we went to understanding, which was natural, mostly naturally la natural language processing. And that was reading text and understanding what it said. Um, that was pretty cool from an insight. So if you remember social listening, maybe as a technique that you may have used uh, to understand what people are saying on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, uh, you'll notice that like you get better and better at kind of understanding what's being said in aggregate. That was understanding. Then the fourth one was generative. And it was always there and it was always pretty bad. In fact, the images that came out were mostly nightmare fuel. It's probably a good way to describe it. Um, the text was clunky. You could tell it was a machine or it just came out wrong and weird. 
it was just odd. And everyone kind of generally for a long time said, this isn't working. And they kind of just ignored it. And it wasn't working until they threw insane amounts of data at it and it got smarter. And then it started to finally hit that break point. So that's where we are now. We're at the bottom of that that hockey stick, if you will, right? We're on the way up. And I actually think this is a wonderful, wonderful time to be alive uh, because one, we're finally getting good at a technology. And what's strange is that I don't think people at Microsoft or OpenAI or Google or any of the research firms at any university kind of realized what was happening at first. And I, I'm not going to take credit for it, but I did notice that it was not happening when it should have, was that we had been talking about knowledge management as a technology, as a, as a theory for decades and couldn't really implement it in one system until now. We can actually say, hey, we've taken all the knowledge, we've trained it, and it's pretty good, not perfect, and I'll talk about that. Uh, not perfect, but pretty good at actually answering questions that maybe an employee asks about the data inside of that organization. And we can kind of feed it back now and actually be mostly correct. This is wild. I don't think people appreciate it. And the people in computer science did not, really realized they were working on knowledge management. And the knowledge management professionals had sort of honestly gotten tired of waiting for the technology or just weren't that into the side of this computer, this, this obscure computer science field that I think only kind of like nerdy guys like myself were into. Um, and then it kind of came together and I, I don't know what happened, but at some point someone's, I, I was talking to some of these very senior people uh, at Google, and they were saying like, oh, we're going to build enterprise search engines based on, a, on or, you know, organizational data. We're going to build a chatbot based on all this training material. I was like, this is knowledge management. And they're like, what? It was like a phrase that is not known in computer science, but also the technology was not being really tested in the knowledge management world. We finally bridged it. And I think we're actually there. So for the people who have um, a background in knowledge management or at least an interest in it, this is a wild time. This is really wild. Um, we're learning a lot of things on the fly. And I'd say the last six months, has had more progress in the last 30 years, which is pretty, pretty awesome time to be alive. So generally I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so that's what we're talking about when they say generation or generative, it does not replace AI. It's just the fourth and some argue last, I don't think that's probably true. I just don't know what else to put on the slide at this point, uh, is that, that we're, it's finally had, having its moment in the sun, just like prediction, classification and understanding. So that's kind of like the framework of where we are. Um, how do they work? Again, insane amounts of data. Like, a, like it requires a lot of computing power and a lot of storage facilities. Um, they build these things called foundation models um, and then organizations, and this is the important part for organizations, not just playing around and writing a poem or something like that or planning a vacation with a chatbot, but you take your organization's data and you mix it in with these large language models. So these models will essentially know how to speak English, but they won't be smart. Your organization's data makes it smart. And you put them together, and now you have something that speaks English really fluently, understands questions, and can answer them with all the smarts. That's where it starts getting really interesting. So they work on this principle of uh, uh, layering or fine-tuning is what it's called. You, if, if you don't have to get into it if you're um, not in the software engineering world. But you do have to understand something called embeddings. And an another fun thing that happened in the computer science community, uh, they're called vector embeddings. Vector embeddings are basically um, <clears throat> allow you to do math on words. Just let that sink in. What a weird sentence, right? So you can say, for example, king plus woman equals what? Queen, right? That's not math, but it mathematically made sense in your head, right? That's how embeddings work. So you can basically say, hey, who is the Tiger Woods of basketball? And you might answer, Michael Jordan. Yeah, there's a couple, there's a little debate there, but uh, that's fair. That's fair. But it would give you the next few answers, right? Like it would be number one, Michael Jordan, maybe two, whatever, right? Like three or four or five. So it, it, it's learned how to do math on concepts or even phrases or even whole documents, right? This technology is over 20 years old, but now we've got massive language models to mix into it. So it's kind of, it's not just like this thing just like popped out of nowhere. No, no, it's this nice confluence of things that, had been worked on, the theory had been kicked around, and finally the right, you know, if you will, the stars aligned, and that's how we got here. Everyone's talking about the world of consumer chatbots, like asking a question, having it do your homework. 
yes, my students use these things to do their assignments. They just have to disclose that they're using it and share the prompt that they used. Why? I can pretty much tell if they know what they're doing with a prompt. So they're getting lazier. I'm getting lazier. Everyone's lazier, but everyone's getting the knowledge that they need, right? So as long as they understand the prompt, I think, or you know, if you can tell if a very complex prompt, you know, answer this question, but do it in this way with this parameters. So that okay, this is this person's got it, right? You know, as opposed to just copy paste the question. So we learn quite a lot from that. So why is everyone um, so excited? It's pretty palpable. The, the excitement around this. Uh, I think some people in the creative arts are scared excited. I think some people in the operations world are really, really excited about this from an efficiency perspective. I think people, um, anyone that involved, like if your job involves documents, this is relevant to you. I don't think we've been able to say something is that widely applicable since the internet. And I like thought about it. that's a pretty obnoxious thing to say. I think this is the most applicable technology uh, to organizations since the internet. And that's, well, because we're just now just learning how some of these use cases are, are working, right? What used to take us a long time now, to, weeks in some cases, now takes us minutes. I used to work on uh, Wall Street and I like, worked in credit research and doing all sorts of financial reports. It took us weeks to put some of these things together because you had to get the dis disparate data sets, you had to get them to match up, you had to come in, you had to analyze it, do the data science work, and then actually interpret it, write a report, make it look nice and ship it. And that was like two weeks. I can do that in about four minutes now, right? Same report. I'd argue probably better, less likely to have silly mistakes, right? So it's pretty, it's pretty wild how that affects finance. The insurance industry adores this technology. Why? They mostly just process documents. Payments, documents, payments, documents. Claims, policies, payments, documents, right? This is all applicable. They can actually do better risk assessment now because they can go look back at documents that they haven't looked at because no one read them because they're from 1987. And it's a scanned PDF that's been sitting in a document warehouse for a long time. They can now analyze it and say, not just one document, but all the people and realize that, oh, we wrote some really weird policies in 1987 that we might want to rectify. You know, That's actually happening now. right? So they're going back and retroactively looking at the crazy things that that insurance salesman put in that contract in 1987 and going, oh, and they know exactly how many people are affected, right? Good or bad, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's the fact is that it was not according to what they had originally structured. Advertising, like I mentioned, like the ability to generate image mod images on the fly for display advertising, write text or search ads, now it takes seconds. You can describe what your brand parameters are and say, I don't want to go outside. Don't, don't say it like this. Always have this tone. This is how we talk. And it'll just do it every time, right? It still requires some approvals, but the process of just sitting there and writing is not, is not as much as it used to be. Um, so um, I, I will, well, we have about 15 minutes at the end for you, if you like, but yeah. Um, so I do think this is pretty, pretty transformational technology. It's, it's pretty wild. And I thought about that for a while. Is this worth saying it's the biggest thing since the internet? Is the obnoxious way to say it? I argue yes. AI is great. Generative AI is way more impactful. Um, so the enterprise versus the consumer. Mostly today I'm going to talk about the enterprise because I think that's actually where all the money is. I think the value is there. I think it's great to write a poem or send a nice text message to your spouse and, you know, that it was written by ChatGPT. Good job. But... Um, the real like game changing stuff is going to be at the enterprise level for a couple reasons. Um, one, um, consumer gen AI fun, play with it. It's a generalized model. It's not fine tuned to your organization. You can upload your own documents, but, and this is actually when you hear about data leakage with generative AI and they say, oh, it's risky. And so on. it's actually because usually because an employee was told, no, you can't use it. They wanted to use it. And they went and took their documents outside of the organization, uploaded it to someone outside the organization, and did the very thing that the IT organization was trying to prevent. This happens way too often. And I want to just make one point that I, that, that I think is spicy, is I think IT policy will actually determine a lot more of the direction and success of organizations. If you have the mentality of a despot and a dictator as an IT organization, it's going to be a rough decade at least. Well, maybe not, because you might not be around in a decade. I, I, I generally think that, because I've seen what happens. Because the worst part is, the most motivated employees 
that are the smartest and adopting the newest technologies the fastest are the ones you're punishing the most. What a terrible, terrible strategy, right? So I think the idea is not to let everyone go wild and upload and download whatever they want. Give them the sandbox, give them the playroom, give them the room to, to, to play with this technology. So one, they do it on the grid. Two, they do it in a safe manner because they're going to do it anyway, right? And three, watch how they use it. I think there's amazing use cases coming out of the same technology. The reason it's quite so powerful is because these organizations can do so many different things with the same model. One lang large language model trained on its the organization's data can be applicable to legal, it can be applicable to marketing, it can be applicable to customer service, it can be the lawyers. I mean, the lawyer contract law is just just got way easier, right? As you can imagine. So that affects how doctors interpret charts, that affects all these kinds of functions throughout the organization that have typically not had anything to do with each other. And now they're all sharing the same model. That's kind of interesting. We've, we've never seen that since what? The internet, right? And that's why I think there's a lot of uh, benefit in the, in, the, in the consumer and enterprise world. All right, so where is the value in this stuff? Again, play with the chatbot, have fun, whatever. Um, the value is in a lot of people talk about savings and they talk about how this is going to save time. It's going to save money. It's going to save royalties on, on stock photography or something like that. Sure. I think that's valid. Most people's careers don't get made on saving money. They get made on generating revenue for the most part. I think that's true. Right. You find a new source of revenue. Mm, all the bosses love it. Right. Uh, because it's hard to, when you get used to savings, you get addicted to revenue. I think that's how it works in the private sector in general, right? So um, a lot of people get a lot of existential dread at this point. They go, okay, I get it. It's powerful. It's a big deal. The internet was kind of a big deal too. Fine. And then they start going, well, and this is what we all do at some point or another. What about me, right? Where do I fit in in this world? Um, I'll tell you, we, you know, we have studied disruption. We've seen a lot of um, I think we've seen case studies. Everyone knows Blockbuster and Netflix. And, you know, we've, we've even teach it in our class um, because it's important. But one of the things that we kind of learned is that it's not actually the threat of a technical disruption that causes problems. It's the response in the existing dominant organization. They panic, they freak out, they make a strategic error, and that is actually where the disruption happens after that, right? Because there's a lot of legacy players have not freaked out not panicked. They've slowly adopted and adjusted, and they're still around to this day, right? At one point, Blockbuster was offered to buy Netflix for a million dollars. What? What? Like, just think about that, you know? Uh, at one point, 16% of Blockbuster's revenue came from late fees alone. 16% of your revenue was based on punishing your customers. It's not a great model, in my opinion. That's a red flag, not you know, a profitable statement. And they were profitable at the time. So where's the value in your job, in your role? And I would argue uh, artificial intelligence, and we've not seen this happen, even despite I am literally talking to every sector, every major company in America at this point, it is not taking jobs. It is taking tasks. I think that's reasonable, right? How many of you remember the um, rotary phone? What was, yeah, I'm dating myself too. I get it. Um, what was the value of rotating the dial? The only thing that happened was you hated people with zeros in their phone numbers. That's actually why I have zero, two zeros in my phone number. This is because I was like, I just remember being like, <laughs> you know, but the fact was there was zero value in the turning of it. So when we had touch tones and you just hit the button, everyone was like, okay, sweet. This is how we do it now. And now we don't think about it. Good. There was zero value in the rotation of the, phone, of the, of the dial, right? I think a lot of things where we assume like doing the work means putting in the sweat equity, as they say, or the keyboard, the key, you know, fingers hitting the keyboard. I think that's an assumption that should be challenged. The thought process that goes into the moment right before you hit the keys is actually the valuable part, right? To get it out of you, to get, extract the value, you have to hit the keyboard. Well, not so much anymore, right? If you have good thoughts, generative AI just became your best friend. I would argue in a lot of, for example, in a lot of the Hollywood world, um, they're getting very nervous about this and you, you'll see that in the news but the fact was is that um the most creative people are having a field day with this all in the right ways it's the hacks the guys who copy and paste 
the ones who just really kind of just rehashing the same idea, they're going to have a harder time. So I think it's understanding where the value comes from. And I actually had a question um, at one of another event I was at, and he said, well, if Gen AI is generating all the content and then Gen AI is summarizing all the content, where do the actual people fit in? And I was like, you know, the content has value in itself if it's helpful, if it's insightful, if it's helpful, if it's, you know, gets you along to do something better or worse. Is it not valuable? Who cares by which process it came from? As long as it's true, as long as it's helpful and valuable, well, I don't see what the problem is. Why? It's like the it's like saying the phone number had something to do with the rotary phone. It had nothing to do with it. It just was the solution at the time because I guess buttons were expensive or something. Um, Reevaluate the value of your tasks. What do you actually do when you do something? Let's talk about what value do you bring to that task? Do you think, do you know something different? And this is like where the term insight gets thrown around a lot. And I think insight has a very, very special, a special meaning. It means it's something that's provable, it's actionable, and it's novel. Two out of those three things are contextual, right? So if you don't know what your insight is, or if you can't think of something insightful, I, maybe it's time to do a little more homework. <laughs> maybe it's time to go out there and explore a little bit, right? A lot of opinions out there that aren't provable. And that doesn't mean they're wrong, but often it does, right? So think about where do you bring value? It's not in the hitting of the keyboard. It's not in the rotating of the phone. It's not necessarily in the, not all meetings are created equal. All consultants know this. Not all hours are created equal, right? Sometimes you have a burst of genius at two in the morning and that's worth a year's of salary. And other times you work for a whole year and you didn't produce anything. That's entirely possible. Way too many heads nodding on that one. Way too many. <laughs> okay. So the value is not necessarily, and I do think it's true, it is in saving time, being more efficient. There are people who are making money from this because they're producing more content. They're actually using this as an insight generator. I'll show you how that kind of works. Some of the more clever companies that I've seen do this. Um, okay, the risks are real. What are the risks? There's the security risk that I talked about. Uh, that's leaking internal data that shouldn't be leaked, special that could be personal identifiable information. Sure, sure, sure. This was true before AI, by the way. So it just continues to be true. That's fine. But the risks are something usually called hallucination. Uh, hallucination, not like drugs. Shout out to drugs winning the war on drugs, by the way. Uh, the hallucination part is actually real, where the machines actually start to misconstrue things. Right? And it's just because the way documents are sometimes written. For example, if you um, have two brothers and you write a Wikipedia article about one brother and you write a Wikipedia about, a, article about the other brother and you both refer to them by their last name, you're going to trigger some hallucination because they don't know who you're quite talking about. Even though the brothers are distinctly human, different humans, they're being referred to as the same name. Right? This happens in the U.S. military first test we you know, did of some public documents that they had released. Awful lot of Rogers in the US military, it turns out. Why? Well, because Roger that, right? So it started mixing up Roger, the guy, and Roger, the confirmation. Common mistake. If you didn't know, the, if you weren't in the US military, you might make the same mistake, right? Once we started feeding it documents where it started to learn the transcripts, it started to learn like, oh, no, the way Roger gets used is important. And there are Rogers in the US military. That's the worst part. It's not actually fully separated. Roger will often say Roger that, and someone will say Roger that to Roger. That's entirely plausible. Rare, but plausible, right? The more data we gave it, it got to about 98% accuracy knowing that when it was a, a affirmation of something, Roger that, and some dude named Roger. So. There are risks and they can be mitigated. Almost always these risks can be mitigated by more data in the right space. If you ask a large language model that is trained on nothing but academic papers and you ask it something general layman's terms, you're going to have a bad time, right? The cool thing is if you train it on both, it can translate for you. I think this is kind of cool. So here's some risks for people. People who use too much jargon, you're going to have a rough time. Uh, there's a famous... Uh, a uh, test we did a number of years ago um, that found out what was the um, what was the phrase that was associated with stock decline that came out of executives' mouths during the earnings call transcripts every 90 days. They have to go on there and say, eh, quote, revenue's up, revenue's down, blah, blah. The phrase was seeking strategic alternatives. Kind of jargony, right? They legally have to tell you something's wrong, but they didn't say how easy it is to make it for you to interpret, right? So when I asked the large language model, what does that mean? It says, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm having trouble finding a solution. And whatever I'm doing right now is not working. 
It's like, oh, okay, that's a lot scarier, but it's the same meaning. And that's because of those embeddings, those vector embeddings I was talking about. It kind of learns, you put all those words together. And it's like, okay, I need, I see, I read between the lines a little bit. It literally actually does create lines in a, in a database. Uh, and it knows that there's really close. So the risks are real. Um, but here's the thing that I don't think people talk about enough in the enterprise world. Sure, there are risks, yes, but it's generally safer in the enterprise world than it is in the consumer world. Why? Why are these models less risky in the enterprise world? Well, two reasons. One, enterprise data tends to be better quality. And the second reason is the employees tend to be better users. Most employees do not spend time hacking, spamming, spoofing, you know, trolling, because why? They might lose their job if they do so. So their behavior tends to be better. Their data tends to be better for it, which means the large language models tend to be cleaner and a lot more accurate. So when you organize properly, and this is why it's so important to not ban things like a dictator, but to open it up, at least internally in a safe environment, is to learn that the data in your organization is generally pretty good. It's not perfect, I bet, right? but it's generally pretty good compared to the random Reddit post or the random thing you might find on a message board. There's a lot of misinformation, accidental and intentional that doesn't seem to happen in organizations as much. And that's a good thing. So I actually think that the, or, the more organized a company is or an organization is, the better they'll actually do in this world. Their answers will be better, the output will be better, and the employees will get better information and over time create more intellectual capital, which leads them to do what? produce more documents, which makes the large language models better, and you start getting this feedback loop, right? And that's what we're starting to see just in the last few months, very, very, very uh, new. Okay, so that's something called the human in the loop. Um, everyone talks about automation, and no, no, what about the people? Well, they're a major component of this. One, they typically produce the training data that goes into these models, but two, they're the ones that validate their right. You get the little thumbs up, little thumbs down, guess what, that's you doing that. Right? So I think that's actually really helpful. I think a lot of organizations have started implementing things like, all right, here's our top questions that we get on our search engine or our chatbot, but here's the official answer. There may be alternative answers that are correct or not correct, but here's the official answer. Feel free to dive in after that, right? Fine. Or they just have an upvote downvote ratio. Every support page you ever said, was this helpful? Up or down? That's a human in the loop. They're starting to learn which ones need to be worked on, which ones need to be improved, or there's something technically wrong. But maybe it was a hallucination. Maybe it was just not correct. The training data was not correct itself. Entirely possible. So the, the risks are pretty real. Um, a lot of people talk about responsible AI, and they make it sound like a moral imperative. You should do this because you should. This usually doesn't work very well for large organizations. They usually need a case for it, right? I've started noticing a pattern is that uh, companies that are employing this technology, their customers are asking, what are you doing? They just want to just spot check, right? No, they're not deep diving. They're not doing audits. They're just being like, what's your, what's your general philosophy on this? And I think a lot of people struggle with policy on this. I think you just need a philosophy. What do you definitely not do, right? I'm not going to generate a guide to making bombs. Good. Okay check, right? You don't have to regulate everything in the sense of, here's what I only will do, but just definitely know the themes or areas you will not play in, right? That's a good start. The second thing, and this is the famous quote, planning is, is uh, indispensable, plans are useless. Just going through the exercise of this makes organizations better. You don't even have to come up with a policy. You just have to go through the thought exercise. One of the best things that um, uh, I saw at Google was uh, we had a process formerly called Lemonade let everyone mull over AI decisions. And if we were going to build something, we put it up there and just let people comment. You'd be surprised how many people who have no title anywhere related to anything AI related are very, very clever on what it could be used for, how it might go wrong, and what process. And it doesn't even mean you have to change anything. Just be like, hey, by the way, this might come up. You've all, all, often avoided disaster just by being aware of what could have gone wrong because you made that tiny little adjustment at the right time that was very small, but before the disaster, not after the disaster. So think about responsibility as not a moral imperative, but just generally a process and a philosophy that keeps you out of trouble. You won't always be able to even prove it either, for that matter, right? But generally, I've noticed the best ones have a philosophical way of thinking about it. And that's as far as they go, because it's an open-ended world. 
in a time of rapid technological change, I think that's probably the minimum and pretty good standard to meet when it comes to being responsible, let alone ethical. Okay. One of the other things that's come up, and this has only come up maybe I'd say like the last like 90 days, is everyone's talking about, okay, well, where'd you, where'd you get the data? Where'd you train it from? What, what, what shady website did you copy it from? Whatever. Here's the question for your organizations. Are the models or whoever's providing these models, whether it be a Microsoft or Google or whoever, are they indemnifying you against it? This is an important question. Well, they say, hey, I will cover you if the data comes from our stuff, I got you covered. This is becoming part of the policy that people are asking now. And that's fair. If you're going to say, yeah, I got this thing, it speaks English. Sure. Are you going to take responsibility for what it says? If they don't, I have more questions, right? And I think that's reasonable. I think it's fair to say that. Now, there are, of course, exceptions or a little less asterisk after all these things, as you can imagine. But generally, are you protected in that when you employ one of these models that someone else trained? You did not, you weren't involved in the process, right? So do you get some sort of guarantee? I think it's fair. And I'm only just seeing that large organizations are starting to be like, okay, I'm going to start using this all over my company or all over my organization. Let's, um, let's cover our butts a little bit here, right? I think that's fair. I think it's totally reasonable to ask these questions. Okay. So what should you expect? No, generative AI will probably not take your job. I don't think that'll happen. Someone using Gen AI might though. That freaks people out a little bit, right? So my suggestion is try it. It's not hard, right? Tinker around with it. I write all, I use all sorts of things. Whenever I have to write an email and I'm notoriously punchy via email, I'm a little edgy. Soften it up a little bit, you know, not a bad idea. People that work with me just smiled way too much. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I remember that one. Um, but yeah, it's it's not hard to use. And I generally think that you're, you being able to craft a four sentence email nicely is not your value and no one should pay you that much for that skill. It's just part of your job. It's just one of your tasks. It's associated, the Venn diagram is there, sure, but it's not your true value as an employee or a worker of any kind, right? It's the rotary dial. We just used it because we had to, right? You have to be able to write an email, sure. Let's just make this easier. I don't see why not, right? I deployed a chatbot that was trained on all my data. And then when people messaged me, they got the chatbot. And when the chatbot lost its confidence and ability to answer the question, it would actually message me, right? I had this running for months, months, and no one knew, right? The biggest mis mistake I made was opening my mouth right about this whole thing, right? But it worked really, really well. And the funny thing was I got feedback because, you know, it was like 360 feedback. And people were like, he's so responsive. He's <laughs> always, it's always available and helpful. I was like, oh my God, that was a large language model. Like, I'm, that means I'm the holdup. Me just like not being on my phone or not being in front of my laptop was the biggest hindrance to a promotion or some sort of career movement. Like, what? Yeah, because I'm human. But the fact was, after you take seven years of me chatting with people, you kind of know what I'm going to say. I don't answer with, hello. I answer with, yo, you know, something like that. That's the whole thing. But the fact was, if I just said, hello, how are you? They would be like, what? No, chatbot. That's a chatbot for sure. They would have known. But when I fine-tuned it with my data, it was really helpful. So I realized that actually responsiveness is actually one of the things in my, at least my role, when I talk to executives, responsiveness is kind of important. You probably could reasonably say, how many, how many dollars per second do they have to wait? Does it cost me? That's, you could theoretically calculate that, right? So why not just have the first message just be quick? Why not? No harm. You still got to do your job. Still got to answer the questions. Still got to go meet people, you know, go talk to them. Still got to get, you know, signatures for documents and stuff like that. But the fact is that there's so many little things that are probably holding you back in terms of your value that have no value inherently to, to, to for, for, for you as an employee. I think we're going to solve a lot of this in the next few years. And I'm worried about the employees that go, I don't need that. It, and they always have a million excuses, right? And is it perfect? Absolutely not. But it's pretty damn good. And I can't say that for everyone I've ever worked with. Present company excluded. <laughs> um, so if you want to get into this, uh, I think the best model that I've seen is people in organizations are building a center of excellence. Why? There's lots of different ways to deploy new technologies. Center of excellence is great because um, it allows you to get really, really good, a small number of people, usually pretty innovative people. They're usually pretty open-minded. And I mean open-minded, like literally they trend high on trait openness, which by the way is measurable with your writing, right? So 
they're open to new technologies. And when things are rapidly changing, you want people who are good at taking on new tasks and working with the unknown. Get really, really good and go around the organization. This is what the best ones did. Um, there's a uh, large Silicon Valley firm that I worked with. Uh, and they just went around asking every single department, what's the most annoying thing about your job? And they kept going around until they find one that generally I could solve. They made friends real quick, real quick, right? And they did like four or five of those. And all of a sudden they were the most popular people in the company, right? Normally change is hard, painful. People attack you. They go after you. They make your life hell. When you solve people's problems, that doesn't happen usually. There's always one, but... The fact is that the center of excellence model is great, except it has one fatal flaw, and people don't talk about this enough. If you're successful in transforming your organization with any technology, you will self-destruct as a center of excellence. Why? Because you have no reason to exist anymore, like the rotary phone, right? So just be aware, if you're going to do this, there is a time limit, and it might be six years, it might be six months, I don't know, but you'll know. When everyone starts deploying it on their own, they start finding it useful, and they kind of like don't go to you anymore, the fuse has been lit. And that's not bad, but you should be aware that there's a fuse. I feel like that's fair, right, uh, to know that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, I think the most creative people are going to have a great time with this. The people who can think about how they think, this is called metacognition, are going to have a wonderful time in the next few years, right? If you're aware about how you think, if you're very good at understanding what's called the sea you swim in, you're going to have great, great progress with this technology. So if you know that you think a certain way and you think it's the preferred way of thinking, great, but you have to be aware you're thinking that way. And a lot of people who have lots of industry experience run into this problem. They get narrower and narrower and narrower the way they think, and they actually become the very risk that they're worried about disruption. They are the literal catalyst for this for this, for this uh, disruption. Um, if you read, uh, Julian Assange had a paper written in 2002, white paper. Um, and this is a guy who knows about how to destroy organizations, let's be clear, right? Uh, he wrote that if you can cause internal panic in an organization, you can do way more damage that way than any other way. He's very clear on this. And he's right. He's read about a lot of things, in fact. He actually knows that if you can if you can create distrust within inside of an organization, basically communication collapses. Knowledge spread just dies, right? You can actually kill an organization from the inside, but that's why leaks are so dangerous and scary in organizations, right? And he runs what? A website called what? WikiLeaks, right? Like that's actually how that works. So if you get really, really good at deploying this technology, you can share information internally safely and do it in a proactive fashion. One of the best use cases I've seen in generative AI is they say, let's take all of our data, let's train it all on a large language model, and then people can ask questions. And if they have access to the documents that have the answer, then give them the answer. And if they don't have access to them, like say, I don't have the answer for that, or I can't, or I won't, or whatever, right? Whatever the prompt you want to use is. Um, and then they go and say, okay, tell me all the things that are relevant like, tell me, I'll summarize everything that's relevant to someone starting in this job. Did you get a really good guide to your job when you started? Why, why can't we do this? Right? Just a summary of maybe big decisions that were made recently or policy changes or whatever it was, right? There's no reason we can't do this. So you take that and you have your list of things that are relevant to every single job title in the, in the organization, right? And then you use regular AI to proactively recommend these things to the people who need to know it when they need to know it, preferably right before, right? Hey, you're going to a meeting with this person. Here's the background on this person. Here's how long they've worked here. Here's what they worked on last projects. Here's, here's whatever documents they wrote. Here's the most recent five documents they've written or commented on or something like that. This would be wonderful. And it's something that really, really good proactive employees do on their own, but it's not the norm. It should be not only the norm, not to do it, but to get it proactively. And we can do this with generative AI plus I can't believe I'm saying this, traditional AI, which is a phrase that I think will take off soon, right? which is kind of wild, right? It's only been a few years. It seems like a really short time. So if you get really, really good at this, um, your ability to come up with new ways of thinking will be totally enabled by this technology, right? One of the most clever ones that I saw was a small electronics manufacturer, five people in this company, right? And they're very, very productive. Like for five people, it's pretty amazing what they've done. And for every single, they work in like smart home like uh, cameras and sensors and stuff like that, right? And they took, uh, they, they have to write a manual that they have to submit to various governments to make sure that, you know, it's all FCC approved and CE approved in Europe and so on and so on. So they have to write the technical manual that none of you ever read, even when you buy these products, right? But it's chock full of detailed information that's kind of important, you know? Uh, so they 
took a large language model, they took all their documentation, threw it on top. And they said, okay, tell me all the questions that this documentation answers. So they got a whole list of questions. And they said, okay, go answer those questions. Their entire website was populated with 10,000 pages of helpful information in a matter of a day, right? It would have been taken them months to do that normally. It took them, literally, they, did, they spent more time formatting the page than they did actually populating these pages, right? And it's five, if you looked at their website, you'd think this was a thousand person company. It's five of them, right? And they just went through and verified, correct, correct, correct. Well, that one's a little off, fix that. So they still have a human in the loop. They just took something that took months and did it in a matter of minutes. And they all did it for, I think, I think their cost was something under $100 in processing power. It's like, huh, what? Like, even if you get some things wrong, because even the human reviewers would have gotten something wrong, this is how incredibly powerful it is for small organizations and larger. If you've got documents, this stuff is helpful. Okay. All right. I call this advancing the front. I always use military analogies. If you've ever seen my lectures, I, I, I think military strategy is fascinating. War is generally bad, <laughs> but military strategy is fascinating. Um, when I say advancing the front is that these are people that have gone beyond just the savings of efficiency and time and effort and labor. They've gone and say like, how do I make money from this? How do I generate revenue? And I think that's always interesting uh, to see how they do it. And they do it very, very differently. So generally they start to say, whatever my main use case is, what's the byproduct of that use case? So for example, there's a, um, have you guys ever done the CAPTCHAs where you have to like, you can't get into a website, they're trying to stop the bots and you have to like, do you ever notice the pattern of those images? It's always like fire hydrants, boats, bicycles, motorcycles. What's the pattern there? Bridges, self-driving cars. So it was actually two engineers at Google. One was like, I got to keep these bots out. I got to figure out a way to stop these bots. And there's this other engineer that was like, I got to get a bunch of people to start telling, like marking what, what is a traffic light and what's a fire hydrant, what's a bicycle. And they looked at each other like, bro, that's actually how that happened. That's actually how that happened, right? So one had a product and then had a, one, and a byproduct and the other one had a product and it was their byproduct, right? So the best, most sustainable organizations tend to, and this is the strategy thinking part, is the best organizations tend to say, my second product will be based on the byproduct of my first one. Why? Because you'll always have a sustainable advantage. If you run a paper plant in Northern Wisconsin, one of your byproducts will be, obviously you got a lot of trees going in there to make the paper, right? One of the pride products is actually really clean water. So why aren't you a bottled water brand after that? Okay, what's the byproduct of being a bottled water brand? Well, you have extra plastic coming from the, you know, making of bottles. Okay, fine, I'm going to make whatever out of plastic. So you always have the sustained advantage because your main, pro your second product is insanely profitable, right? Because it is subsidized by the first. If you start to think like this, the generative AI world gets pretty wild pretty quickly. Um, generally what they do is they say, I'm going to make a model. It's going to have some efficiency. And here's where they make the big leap. They say, I'm going to provide it to the world for either free or dirt cheap, or maybe you have to pay if you use a lot of it, right? And they usually do this with something called an API, application programming interface. You're providing data out into the world, okay? Most organizations will go, why would I do that? That is a risk, that's releasing my, well, it has to be data that's not harmful if you do release it. But two things happen. One, you start to find out who is interested in your data, and it's usually not who you think it is, right? Smart organizations know what their data is worth, and they really know who would find it worthwhile. So they put it out there for free and let people use it so they get a, you know, kind of lure them in for free. And then two, what they do is they make sure that the public version that they, that they put out there is always at least one step behind their internal version. So they always have what? A sustained advantage. So they'll actually give it away for free because it's old, it's stale, it's not useful to them anymore because they have a new version. They'll give away an old version for free and that keeps all their competitors that aren't as innovative at bay right? They're getting value. They're still not complaining, but they're never going to beat them, right? This is called honeypot theory. Um, you basically, you make it, you can't not put your hand in the honeypot and you give away data for free. And a lot of these models produce a lot of byproduct data. So you might say, I have a large language model. Maybe it's all trained on super smart financial data. Maybe I'll give it to, I don't know, Wall Street bets or whatever on Reddit or something like that. Just let's see what they ask. So see, what, see what they look up and then try and find it. And then here's the thing. If you have someone that's a power user, you can say, hey, 
if you use it more than X times per day or whatever, you got to start paying. And then it becomes a revenue generating model. And that's how some of these companies that are nothing to do with the data economy are starting to make money and they're starting to gain competitive advantage all while doing this relatively uh, new technology called generative AI. So it's really cool to kind of see this kind of world that they're building around this technology that originally knowledge management professionals have been talking about for decades. And computer scientists kind of just recently got good at, right? So generally, I think if you can think sustainably, uh, it's, uh, it's a good idea. Th sustainability meaning that all your byproducts uh, are getting down to the basics. Um, of course, I'm a lecturer, so I'll give you a signed reading. <laughs> um, if you're interested in the sustainability theory, there's a great book called um, The Ecology of Commerce with Paul, by Paul Hawken. He's the one that talks about the paper plants and, and the byproducts. Of that. Wonderful book, written in 1987. I never thought it would have anything to do with AI. It does not on the surface, but the strategy is there. Everybody Lies is a great book about data. I'm warning you, it gets a little spicy. It's not for the kiddies. But it is pretty interesting about how this guy uses data to kind of prove people wrong. And, you know, like it, it's very clever usage. Uh, and if you want to focus on the business stuff, Competing in the Age of AI, it's one of the required readings for my master's uh, class here at Columbia University. Wonderful book about how executives got the most functional AI companies up and running uh, years ago and the policies they kind of have in mind. Um, with that, I'll just wrap a couple things before Q&A. One, Take your data seriously. If your data's junk, everything's junk after that. You cannot monetize, you cannot train, you will get bad answers, you will get hallucinations, everything goes wrong. Take your data seriously. Two, uh, understand enterprise versus consumer. Everything in the press is about consumer. Where the big fight is, is in enterprise. Uh, and that's where all the money is. And I think that's actually where the most benefit for organizations will come. Uh, and if this still gives you some sense of existential dread, the one antidote to your own personal disruption, generally, is being a lifelong learner. People who know how to learn never get caught up in this stuff. They're always on the front end. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you. Questions, comments, and of course, my personal favorite, scathing rebuttal. <laughs> Thoughts, questions? So I've mostly talked about large language models, large image models of the image version one, right? So it basically takes, uh, you say, I want to rabbit, you know, riding a skateboard on the beaches of Laguna Beach or something like that. It knows those words. It knows those concepts. It, the image model should have some photos of rabbits and skateboards and whatever. Uh, and it learns the transformer technology actually makes it work. So it kind of fits nicely. Um, if you don't have enough training data, it comes out horrible. But there's a certain point where you have enough images that it does generate that image. And the image, judging images, like how the quality of them is actually really, it's actually harder than the large language models. Because you can be like, yeah, that's not a rabbit, that's a hare or something like that. And you get this kind of like fight over pedantic stuff like this. Um, but generally, yeah, it, it basically takes a sentence and then it will generate an image based on what you describe, which is exactly how artist, artistry works. You know, you say, I, I, in my head, I have this vision. Well, we've kind of got like a low level version of it. Video, that's the next one. Or that's in, that's in research right now at every major tech company. Um, you could describe a scene and it'll produce a scene, right? I'd say right now the technology is like meme quality is probably the best way to put it, you know? Um, it's kind of clunky, but because uh, video is not just 30 times, 30 images per second. It's it's much more complex than that. Um, but yeah, that's that's what we do as the image models and then mixing that with audio. So yeah, that's multimodal. It's, it's, it's very, very hard to get right. And we're just kind of tinkering with it now. But yeah, that's where it'll go in the future. Um, it probably won't produce Hollywood quality stuff because it doesn't really know narrative very well. But if you want just like a montage of things, you know, like a sizzle reel, it should be pretty good at that within, I'd say, a year or two. Yeah. Check out um, uh, Imagine, uh, spelled M-I-M-A-G-E-N. Uh, that's Google's model. Uh, Chat, GPT, OpenAI has one called Dolly, uh, Dolly, D-A-L-L-E. That's their image generator. There's also Midjourney from... Um, Discord, uh, there's a bunch of other ones too. Yeah, they're, they're playing around with them. You can play around with them for mostly free, which is pretty cool. I don't get, I mean, the more you learn about this technology, the less of the sort of like, you know, scary stuff kind of has weight. But, <laughs> but uh, I have noticed an ugly trend um, that I don't think people are talking about enough. Governments are starting to release data that is suspiciously friendly to their regime and hoping that it gets picked up right and it's you know it's modern propaganda 
and they're hoping it gets kind of slurped up in this in these things. So I think the data sources are important. So um, when you're talking about um, this is why the human in the loop thing is so important. Automated decision making, generally a bad idea, in my opinion. Assisted decision making, sure, great idea, generally, I would say, right? So having a human expert review um, approval process, I think this is still a thing. I still think curation is important. Um, automated decision making, that kind of scares me. And I think um, governments using it uh, for propagandic purposes, I think is kind of problematic. And we're just starting to see that already. And it's like, I, when I saw that, I was like, Oh, it's ugly, you know. So uh, I do worry about that a little bit. Yeah. Your organization's biases will end up in these things. <laughs> Period. You'll just you'll you'll it'll be so these things don't become biased on their own. They become biased because of the training data and the policies that went into the selection of said training data, right? Um, that has to be thought through. I think the best organizations spend more time debating what data they're going to use under what circumstances and when than actually building the stuff. If you spend a lot of time here, you will pretty much prevent disaster here. So I think that's important. Um, people say like talk is, the, engineers just wanna start building stuff. This is a fatal flaw, right? And executives just want like, you know, they wanna have like a thing they can talk about. This is also a fatal flaw, right? They've gotta got kind of work together. So yeah, I, I think that's um, pretty important. The, the, the policies around where the data comes from is very important. If you have a bunch of like war games stuff, kind of like, oh, here's a situation that haven't happened. You might not want to train data on that. You might not want to put payroll data inside your large language model. You, there's also the things you probably don't want to put in there, right? And you should have that, like I said, that planning is indispensable, plans are useless. I think that's part of the process, yeah. Yeah, intellectual property. Um, so two things. One, separate ownership from copyright. They're not always the same thing. So for example, theoretically, yes, they could, right? Um, I would argue there should be a royalty system of some sort that if you use that, that uh, if you use a reimagined version of that stock photo actor, they should get their portion, you know, accordingly. I think that's actually relatively easy to do. You know, that's, you know, how much of that, of the images that you, that you took in that photo shoot, did you use in that? Okay, pay them accordingly, right? I think that's fair. Um, when you generate your own imagery, generally, uh, uh, if you fine tune it, it's yours because you're, you know, in these enterprise environments. Um, if you're using a consumer model, it's up to their policies. Who knows? I don't know. It depends on which one you use, right? They might say, hey, all our images are ours. Um, in, a, in, the, in the enterprise world, if basically if you're paying for the, for the processing of it, generally you own them. That doesn't mean you own the copyright, though. The U.S. Copyright Office has come out and said essentially purely, purely being the important word, purely machine-generated images are not copyrightable. If you make any edit to them, they are, right? So it's like slap your logo on it, boom, done, it's yours, right? So that's that's still going to get worked out in the courts. But generally ownership, if you pay for the processing, it's generally yours for most of the platforms that I've seen, Google, Microsoft, um, and, and other ones are in that in that camp um, because they're in, the, they're in the, the business of computing power, not necessarily image ownership, right? Um, especially if you use your own, cop your own copyrighted or proprietary data on top of them, then it's almost always yours. Um, but will the copyright office honor that? That's a different thing. And we're going to find out in the court system in the next few months, probably, maybe maybe a year. Yeah, it's a, there's two schools of thought there. Um, you used someone to train the data. Okay, well, it was a copyright free in the first place. It should be for generally for enterprise use. And then you put on your special stuff, then it's yours. Good job. Uh, and the other school of thought is, is that everything net new is everything net new and no one can claim anything because all all artists were influenced by some artists at some point. Do do they go back, back, pay them? Like, you know, does Taylor Swift go pay Madonna because it kind of like happened to have a similar kind of tone? No, in this case. So that's what the courts will decide. You know, it's going to be a wild one. There's probably a whole new subgenre of, of legal, like, like type of lawyer. It won't just be IP lawyer, but like AI IP lawyer. And that's already happening. Uh, regulation generally is for the you know protecting people who who might be otherwise harmed or whatever. Um, generally, it should be not at the technology level. I think it should be at the industry level. Like I see, I could see regulations on insurance in that world. That makes sense. There are regulations on insurance already. Like it makes sense that that's a decent framework. Um, on the other hand, I don't you know sometimes they say like oh we're gonna like there's a whole push on like we're gonna pause research development on AI. And I was like how. It's not even feasible. Like, yeah, yeah, some in the industry said that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's. Um, I don't know what the future of that is. I, I'm. I am. I do worry about. You want to talk about economic impact? 
blowing this stuff up is probably the worst possible option. <laughs> you know, it's a, there's so much to be gained in terms of efficiency, in terms of actually new job prompt engineer is now a new job title. We've created new job titles and jobs through some of this. So like I said, it's about tasks, not jobs, but I definitely think if you just regulate it away, you're definitely going to impact jobs. That's like, I, I actually worry about that. And that seems to be kind of lost in the debate. Well, it, it depends on the, yeah, so it is based on the objective. Everything's objective for the objective, <laughs> right? So awesome book about this, by the way. She brings a really good point. The development happening in China is mind boggling in AI. It's so impressive. The number of research papers that are coming out on AI, I would argue are on average, not quite as good as happening in, in, in the US, but the sheer volume of them is coming out is like tenfold, right? So at some point something happens, right? Um, Great book about this is called AI Superpowers, written by Kai Fu Lee. He's the former head of Google China. He was um, very, very smart about this. Uh, and he basically said, you have to understand that there's like kind of three different worlds in AI. There's the US, which is almost entirely private sector based. So ROI is usually the number one objective, right? You spent money on it, you have to get, you have to build something that delivers something sooner or later based on what you spent. Um, the European model seems to be like regulate first, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> right. And I, I think that's actually going to hurt them a little bit, my personal opinion, of course. Uh, and then the Chinese model, which is state sponsored, almost pure competition. So they'll say, I'm going to give essentially venture capital at the state level to a thousand firms and let them battle it out because that will accelerate research. And I'd argue it's pretty much working. The philosophical differences are pretty major, uh, I would say. Um, also, you talk about bilingual thing, really interesting. If you ever want to see if a policy makes sense inside of your company, uh, ask people in a second language that's like probably they're fluent or native in if that logic makes sense and then ask them again in English in their second language. There's good research that shows that your second, third, fourth language you're actually more rational in than your original because there's no cultural baggage associated with your second, third, but all that, all the words that have kind of weird cultural weight, like maybe from the news or what you happened to do as a kid or the stories you read or whatever. Like perfect example, even just between British English and American English. British English, if you say it's like, oh, it's a government scheme, they're all like, oh, got it. I understand. Now I'll go sign up for the scheme. If you say that in American English, it sounds like a criminal enterprise, right? You're like, a scheme? That's that's not good. And that's in the same language, just a minor dialect difference, right? So it's a funny thing. If you want to kind of test your logic, using a second, third, fourth language is actually a really good way to do it, right? So to your point. But yeah, the, the three different models, like, you know, uh, high ROI, regulate, and then just pure state sponsored competition which is such a strange phrase is it's fat i mean we're seeing the 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 some of the rise in like theory that comes out of um uh, china is, is absolutely fascinating and if you look at the difference between like japan south korea and china their policy is often different there and that's kind of interesting in itself so it's not a question of east versus west it's literally uh you know the the the, the policies of, of governments that are that are affecting it and i think i think it's pretty interesting if you want to read that book ai superpowers which is funny because they compare all of china to just silicon valley Think about that. All of China, one point, whatever, four billion people versus the Bay Area. Like that's wild. That also shows the massive advantage the United States has, at least for now, in this space. So kind of interesting. I think that's, I'm trying to be as objective as possible. You have to be very careful with national comparisons, but. Um, so where your data gets processed matters. Uh, so Google is carbon neutral. In general, so they say yes, it takes a lot of electricity. Yeah, it does. It's also we're neutral and we buy tons of credits. That doesn't mean you're carbon negative. That's different. But we're allegedly Google is going to be allegedly carbon ne negative by 2030, right? So it'll have a sort of zero net impact. Now, granted, if you run it on, you build your own data center on some dirty grid, like okay, well that's going to happen, right? So it does take a ton of computing power. The funny thing is that, for example, there are solutions on how electricity gets redistributed called smart smart grid stuff powered by AI that makes up not only it more efficient for people who have solar panels and stuff like that, it also pays for itself because it's so good at it. Like there's so much waste of energy outside of this that AI can probably solve net benefit that I think that's actually probably where we're moving. Um, uh, yes, yeah, like the, the, for example, if you can cleverly use AI to model the roof of your house or the roof of your building to adjust the solar panel just enough to get a little bit of electricity and you let it sit there for 20 years, believe me, it was worth the computing power. You know, so that's where we're going to see the cost benefit analysis. And it's pretty rational, you know, uh, way to think. It's just, it's always one layer deeper. You know, they say like, uh, it's always not just like, oh, it uses power. That's bad. Well, 
depends where the power came from. Yeah, that's a that's a big debate that I think they don't get into the details enough on, like nuclear versus solar and all sorts of things. So they would have to have a secure perimeter, like and governments are actually pretty good at that in general, you know, considering how much valuable data they have. Um, every single citizen service should be using a chatbot of some sort because there's so many questions that get asked. They don't have to go to the office. Most, just like insurance, most government is pretty much paperwork, right? There's some stuff that has to be done. There's policing and there's, you know, physical things like wars have to be fought and so on and so forth. But generally, uh, it's mostly a paper operation. And I think that that could easily be done with a lot of generative AI. So that means every interaction on the, on the citizen level, uh, that could be like everything from the driver's licenses. So like... The, the application around just own property ownership and the paperwork associated with that, like title transfers, this should be so much easier. It's wild how hard they've made it. And it's just because it's layered on layered on layered on layered on layered after decades and decades. And no one just said, hey, whoosh, like, let's just, what's the core stuff we need to get done? And there's been no revamp of it. And I'd argue you could probably get to that point, right? Um, so yeah, I think the, the citizen services are a big deal. Property, lo, uh, municipal and state probably have a better opportunity, I think, um, because they have so much good data, um, permitting processes, all these kinds of things. It could, could be much, much easier. Can I build a fence in my backyard? Oh, it has to be under six foot. Okay, fine. Like this is, these are questions that citizens have and they have generally become so disillusioned that they don't ask anymore and they just break the law. This isn't generally a good thing. <laughs> like I think we should, we should, People should follow the law. You should also make the law easy to interpret. We write laws that are nearly impossible for the average person to read and understand. I know because I take the bills that go into Congress and I summarize them with generative AI and I email them to my congressman. So he doesn't get to say, I didn't read it, <laughs> right? But I mean, really, we could make we could make government interactions so much better with this technology. Uh, that's If that's not, I mean, if we just do that alone, I'd be a pretty happy guy. So rewarding the specialists is actually becoming, now because all those in vettings, for example, it's possible to say, hey, we actually know this person's an expert in this and they've been doing this awesome thing and it's not in their job title. Those people are getting rewarded now, which is kind of awesome. Their knowledge is also being captured, which is good and generally spread throughout the organization. So it's not really about like the T-shaped, like generalist versus specialist. Like there's just so many holes in everyone's knowledge, right? And we're starting to slowly close those holes. I think that's a better analogy because I, of all the parts of all of your jobs, you're like, yeah, I got that, I got that. I'm like, I'm not quite sure about that. I probably should be, but it's not worth the extra effort. If it was a chatbot, it'd be pretty much worth the extra effort. Just like ask the question, get the answer. So I don't think it's about specialists versus generalists. I think the, generally AI is specializing more and more, but it will be mostly about filling those gaps that you might not even know you have. Right. And that's where the proactive kind of recommendation of knowledge management might be really good. Yeah. So uh, Microsoft invested in OpenAI. OpenAI yeah. was started as a nonprofit and now has changed to a capped for profit or something like that. I think it was. Um, they basically converted generally. Um, but they didn't get more than 50%. And it turns out that last 50%, that like 40 to 50% is kind of a critical one. Uh, and I think that's probably a strategy that's, you know, very intentional. Um, let's be clear, you, uh, Microsoft has incredible resources when it comes to computing power. OpenAI had figured out some very, very clever methodologies. These are, these are a match, right? They need to train these models and it costs, it can cost $30 million in computing power to train some of these models. That's how large, large doesn't, like I said, large is kind of like a little bit of a misnomer, right? They can cost tens of millions of dollars to train these things. So a uh, startup with some funding even maybe 10 billion, they're going to burn through that pretty quickly. And that's not even paying people. That's not even all this stuff. That's just running it, right? So I think it was a match, a pretty smart match. There's a, and the, the, So the, the Microsoft, Amazon, Google are all called hyperscalers. And that's because they have massive data centers that can handle large amounts. Whatever you can throw at it, they can pretty much handle generally, right? Um, we will find the limit to that at some point. Uh, but that's what they needed. They needed computing power and they didn't, they weren't going to spend their own money building a data center and that would have been taken them over a year to do. They needed large amounts of computing power very, very fast. Uh, and, and Microsoft was one of the players that could have delivered that. So that was the reason for that. The 49 to 50% thing, that's a different strategic move. That's, that's maintaining control, which, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of founders do and they take it very seriously. Um, they don't want to be told what to do. They think that they are the best person to run it. Maybe they are. 
Maybe they are for a while, and then maybe they're not after a while. <laughs> that's up for debate. So yeah, that's the reason for that. If you look at the numbers, it's always in the numbers right there. Yeah, great question. With that, thank you very much. My name is Ben Rice. I appreciate your time. Thank you.